afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Good. Was the conference worthwhile? Yeah. All right. I'm going to see how worthwhile it, it was. At the end of uh, my remarks, I want to maybe open it up to a little Q&A or have you guys kind of report out a couple highlights from the conference. I think that exchange would be kind of neat for me. Um, let's see. You know, there's so much to talk about, and I was trying to figure out how could I add value in terms of what you guys have participated or heard in the last couple of days. And you know, the theme of this conference is transforming big ideas into bold action. And I think my takeaway would, would be this just from the start is, anybody see the new Michael Jackson movie, This Is It? Raise your hand if you saw This Is It. OK, even if you didn't see it, you'll understand my point here. <laughs> you know, this isn't it meaning it all starts when we leave here. You know, what we heard today is, and yesterday and the day before is just the beginning. That should be the spark to ignite what we do from now until the time that we come back next year. If we just take what we've heard from the last three days and think this is it, we won't get anywhere. We'll be frustrated and it'll be another failed effort. So I, I would just challenge this group, first of all, to understand the beginning starts when you leave here and how do you implement or actualize or share some of the ideas that you've learned um, as a part of this conference. Um, I speak today probably from three perspectives. First, as a mayor, uh, the mayor of Sacramento, California, the capital of California, seventh largest economy in the world. So that's one perspective as an elected official. The second perspective I speak from is I ran charter schools um, before I ran for mayor. So as a, as a charter management organization, a CMO, I have that perspective, being in the trenches with you. And then I think the most important perspective of all is I was one of those poor kids in a poor neighborhood who didn't get a good education. And that to me is what I bring to this dialogue. I'm one of them who somehow was lucky enough to make it out and are telling the story on what I think we need in those communities. So my perspective comes from, from those three vantage points. Um, I want to start with a quote. And this quote is by Sir Edmund Burke. He was a British politician who supported the American Revolution. Anybody heard of Edmund Burke? A couple of you? Historic history majors in here? OK, great. Um, his quote was this, to innovate is to not reform. To innovate is to not reform. And what he was really saying is, and it applies to education as well, if we want to try to continually reform the system that is broken and has been broken for so long, I'm not sure we're going to get there. But if you want to truly innovate, if you want to truly do something bold, if you want to truly make something a reality, you've got to say, we're going to just take this thing head on we don't care about the risk. We're going to do what's right. And that innovation will give you the freedom to do whatever you want to do. And that's kind of just my perspective is I'm, I'm OK on reform and kind of in theory and what you talk about in terms of reform. But for me, to innovate is not reform. You have to have the freedom and the belief that you're not going to hold back on anything. And you're not going to worry about what people say you're going to keep your eye on the prize and ultimately do something very innovative and creative. And I think this, is, again, captures the spirit of this conference. Um, when I think you leaving here, it's about how do we rejuvenate, re-examine our purpose? Again, that's what you guys have been talking about, I hope. And I'll hear a little, I'm going to test you a little later. But how do we re-examine our purpose and what we do? Because this, this space of education is so important. It is so important. And each of you deserve to be you know, saluted for being involved and committed um, to this industry because it's a thankless. I think you guys, you don't make the money you'd like to make. You don't get the accolades. You don't get the constant feedback telling you you're doing a good job. But nonetheless, you've chosen a noble profession in some respect whether you work directly in education or whether you're trying to improve education, nonetheless, it stands true. So for me, it's to, to innovate, reimagine, and reinvent what we're trying to do in our public schools. And that, again, that's just my mindset uh, moving forward. So let me start with a couple statistics. 
that our public schools are failing our children from California to New York City, from the East Coast to the West Coast, failing our kids. Only 70% of high school graduates, only 70% of high school kids graduate. That means 30% don't. And if you're a minority student, one out of two graduate, which means one out of two don't. That should be terrifying in the greatest nation in the world. Most of these kids who do graduate, they go to college and they're not ready, which is a whole nother story. And the dynamics, as I said earlier, are even worse when you're talking about underserved communities. Another data point, only 7% of African Americans and only 9% of Latino Americans in eighth grade reached the proficient levels on the NAEP test. So let me say that again. 7% of African Americans, 9% of Latino kids in eighth grade are doing grade level work in math and reading. That's dismal. Basically what you're saying is less than 10% of that population is not at grade level. Only 10% is at grade level. That means 90% is not. That's very, very alarming um, to us all. And these are facts and data points that we cannot escape. Again, California, raise your hand if you're from California. Okay, almost the whole room. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you're from somewhere in the Midwest. Okay, hands down. East Coast? Okay. So in California, this data point resonates around the country. It's not one just just uh, relevant to California. Out of 100 Latino kids who enter kindergarten, only 11 of them go on to get a college diploma. So 100 kids in kindergarten, only 11 go on and get a college diploma. And raise your hand if you've heard of the, the achievement gap. Just checking. So you know the achievement gap can be explained in many ways. But since I'm on a data kick right at the moment, uh, let me give one last data point. That black and Black and African American, black and Latino kids who graduate 12th grade, they perform at the same level as white middle schoolers. So 12th grade, 8th grade. So simply put, a four year or a four year grade level gap in terms of Latino kids, African Americans, and their white counterparts. That is troubling to me, and it's what makes me wake up every day. And it's why I actually ran for mayor in Sacramento. Um, I don't have any jurisdiction whatsoever over the schools in Sacramento, not even a dotted line. But I believed as a mayor I would be able to use this platform as a bully pulpit and talk about what's most important and make it a priority in my city. And I've been able to do that, ironically enough. But I don't have any real jurisdiction over our schools. But I feel nonetheless, even though it wasn't in my job description, I had a responsibility because if you want a great school, a great city, you need great schools. You'll never have a great city without great schools. No mayor in this country is not going to tell you that there are three priorities, public safety, education, job, economic development. And they're all inextricably linked and connected. They all go together. You want more safer streets, you get better schools. You want a more educated workforce, schools, is, schools and education is a linchpin for everything we do. And not, a, not, a lot, not enough elected officials understand that. The dropout statistics in our country, every 26 seconds somebody drops out in our country. In California, one out of four of our kids are dropping out, which is very significant. You take one of our high schools in Sacramento, one out of three kids is dropping out. And it's like, what happens to these other kids? Where do these kids go who drop out? In California, you got 120,000 kids who start ninth grade, and by the time they get to 12th grade, they don't graduate. Where do these kids go? Where do they end up? What happens to them? It costs over $40 billion to our state in the life of these kids in terms of the cost of society. <laughs> that is significant. 120,000 kids who don't finish. And if you think about our country, we used to be the leader 
as a country. And right now in math and science, we're number 18 and 25 worldwide in terms of those areas. That means we can't even compete globally anymore. So I say all that to say it's all of our problem. People can't say I don't want to be involved or education is not important or I don't have kids or my kid gets a great education because they go to private school or I'm lucky enough to be able to buy a house in a good neighborhood that has great public schools. That it's all of our problem. It's going to impact all of us. You guys remember when Columbine happened? And the first comments were, oh, that was so tragic. But that was in that neighborhood. Then over the next few months, it happened in the South. It happened in Oregon. And it's really just saying that if we don't get a, a hold on some of these challenges, it's going to happen in our neighborhood soon enough. It will impact us. And I think that's why we need, such, we need to understand there's a sense of urgency in terms of our school system in our country. So with that said, in terms of the dismal side of things, has anybody in here heard of a pit school? Really? Can I ask you, do you or do you not want me to put you on the spot? Oh, okay. No, 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 that's okay. So what she did, there's something called KIPP schools, which are really good charter schools, which I'll probably refer to in a minute. But there's something called a PITT, P-I-T-T -T school. Anybody heard of that? So a PITT school, in terms of context, back in you know, late 1800s, when African Americans were slaves, prior to them you know, being free, um, African Americans weren't black people back then, or I won't use the other word, but people of color. <laughs> back then, they were not allowed to assemble together, except for two places, on the field when they were working, or in a church. Those were the only two places that African Americans could assemble, you know, together and not risk something drastic happening physically, you know, to you or your family member. So what African Americans did back then, they were innovative. Conference theme here, innovative. What they did at the end of the night, uh, masters and slave owners go to sleep, they come home, have been working in the field for you know, since five in the morning till five at night, they cook, they do all those things, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. What they did was they take their Bible and said, this is our textbook. This is how we're going to teach our young how to read. And not very many knew how to read who were adults. So what they did is, out back behind their cabin or wherever they lived, they dug a hole in the ground, a pit, that went down, you know, 10, 10 feet or so and they covered it with leaves over the top of it. And they took a candle, a textbook, and a young person, and they went down there, and they taught young people how to read. And think about this for a moment. If they got caught, what would happen? Get killed, get lynched, get beat, all these things that we've heard about would actually really happen. So. I ask us today, what sacrifice or risk are we really willing to take when it comes to ensuring that our children, whether they're own, our own or not, are getting good education, getting access to good education? That to me is an alarm, that to me is a wake up call. They were really willing to risk a limb being cut off to make sure their own children or other children knew how to read. And the flip side of the question for us is, what are we willing to risk? But the flip side for them is they understood it was the most important thing in the world. So you had no choice but to risk it all. Because if you wanted these children to have a decent life, you had to make sure they knew how to read and, and compute and do all those sorts of things. Because the whole slave trade, which you guys know, was based on economics. And again, the smarter you are, the more you, you have an education, you can figure these things out. So as it relates to us today, I think about my purpose, and it's I want to sacrifice, or I am willing to sacrifice everything to make sure kids in every neighborhood, even if I don't know them, have access to American Dream, which we don't have today. We have many kids who do not have access to an American Dream, and it can happen, it should happen. And on the flip side, 
It is the most important thing. In my opinion, and I would share this with this group here today, education is a civil rights issue of the 21st century. Education is, a civil right, is our civil rights issue of the 21st century. It truly is. Now, if you guys leave here and are motivated and inspired for another couple days and then pretty soon everything goes back to normal, then we didn't do our part. It's got to keep you up at night. And that's why I wanted to share that pit school story with you because it's something you can draw, draw from as time goes on. So back in Sacramento, which is where I grew up, in 2002, the high school that I went to, Sacramento High School, second oldest high school west of the Mississippi. I went to the high school, grew up in a poor neighborhood. I went to the high school. My mom went to the high school. My father went to the high school. My grandfather went to the high school. I don't have any kids, whether they like it or not, they're going to the high school. So <laughs> there's a tradition in this darn high school. It was about to be taken over by the state of California because it was not performing well. So you have three, four, or five years of consistently not doing what you're supposed to do. You're in program improvement. The school districts try to fix it. They don't do it. Pretty soon the state comes in and says, you need to either do something radical with the school or we're going to run it. And I think most of you, even if you're not from California, you understand the state does not have a good track record of even handling its own set of issues, let alone little neighborhood high schools. That would not have been good for anybody. So we went to the superintendent at the time and asked him, his name was Jim Sweeney, and we asked him, would you allow us to run Sacramento High School as a charter school? And he said, I was about to say off the record, but I can't remember. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. He said something to the effect that we as a school district aren't doing as good a job as we'd like. And yes, I'm willing to risk and take a risk to find out whether your community organization, your charter school operators can do better job than we're doing. So they allowed us to do it. They allowed us to run a big high school as a charter school. Everybody okay on that? I'm going to give Yvonne some, some credit in a minute here. <laughs> um, and this is very important. It's very important because, again, I'm talking about risk and willing to take on the status quo. So I graduated from this high school. I'm living in Phoenix. I played 12 years in the NBA. I came back home running this charter school organization. I go speak to the teachers December 9th, 2002. About 100 teachers, about this size of folks in the room. And I say, hey, here's what we're going to do. The high school is about to be taken over by the state of California. We don't want that. And they're like, no, we don't want that. And I said, I'm a community kid. I came back from the neighborhood. I want to see if we can kind of break down this big, large, comprehensive high school into smaller learning communities. And they're like, exactly what we need. This is great. I finish my comments. I get a standing ovation. Teachers come up to me, and I remember this one quote, thank you for restoring the faith and trust in teachers and public education. I remember that quote. That was on December 9th. Came back a week later. Same group of people, same size, different reaction. I got booed. I'm like, what in the, <laughs> the cameras? Um, what, what? Chucks, what happened since the last time? <laughs> since the last time I was here. And as sad as this is, the teachers union said, we can't let him do that. And I'm just thinking that, now again, when I say teachers union, all teachers unions aren't bad. Certainly teachers, all unions don't speak on behalf of teachers. But the reality is the teachers union started this propaganda that you won't make the same wages, your jobs won't be safe, blah, blah, blah. It all, you know, the same story. And I literally got booed from the same group of people. I'll fast forward. From that month, December of 02, the teachers union sued our little small charter organization and the school district. And over the next 10 months, they spent $750,000 preserving the status quo. Meaning saying, this school doesn't work, and we know it, but we need to keep it just the way it is. Versus an organization that had a track record of doing some successful things, trying to think outside of the box, trying to bring a different reality 
to the families and children of that community. $750,000 spent. A local law firm saw this take place. They said, we're going to give you pro bono legal services. So had it not been for this organization who gave us this law firm $500,000, which equated to us being able to combat that lawsuit, we would not have been able to prevail. We did prevail, which is the good news. So that wasn't the applause line yet, but thank you. So what we did on this school, and Yvonne, raise your hand, it's Chan here. So she was a pioneer in this movement of saying you have to sometimes convert or close down or reconstitute to reinvent schools when they don't work. That is what is happening now at the national level. The Obama administration and his Secretary of Education is now saying your bottom 5% of schools that aren't performing, they need to be closed down and reopened. She was ahead of the game. What we were able to do in Sacramento was ahead of the game. Let me, let me connect the dots here. Before we took over that high school, only 20% of seniors were getting accepted to a four-year college. Only 20% of seniors at this high school were getting accepted to a four-year college. Our first graduating class, our very first year one, two, three, four, the ninth grade all the way through, our first graduating class that had been there since ninth grade, 73% got accepted to a four-year college. Seven, that's the applause line. 73%. What happened? Same kids, same neighborhood. You create a different culture. You bring in teachers who, who get it and aren't afraid of data. You bring in an effective school leader. You involve parents. And then you have a no-nonsense yet fun environment. It's not rocket science. I'm sorry, that's not the big idea. The, the big idea there is a simple one. But it's hard to stick with and stick to because all the challenges of the force and the status quo that may be will throw everything at you to sink things like that. So that high school, let me, that was in 2007. The next year, 83% of kids got accepted to a four-year college. So we're averaging 75 to 80% of kids that are accepted to a four-year college. You guys know what the API score is? Raise your hand if you know API. That is the most convoluted, complicated, nonsensical way of explaining whether schools are doing well or not, because half the people can't understand it, even if you know what it is. And that's a problem in of itself, but I'm going to use it really quickly here. Last year, the high school, Sacramento High School, for any high school that had more than 300 students in it, so a larger high school, had the biggest growth on the API in the state of California. The biggest growth on API out of any high school, more than 300 kids. And there's something called a all-school rank in a similar school rank. You guys familiar with that? So Sacramento High School, I got a 10, the highest you can get on similar school rank. Now my point is, wouldn't you want to know what worked? Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't you want to like share and figure, and what doesn't work, don't do this, and we've learned, but here's what worked. So you put Sacramento High School here. Let me connect it. I grew up in this community. I told you I had three perspectives in my comments. People give up on high school students. We often say it's too late. You can't make a difference. I was one of those kids. So I can't have that perspective. I can't ever say it's too late. So I've got to always fight for that group of kids. However, I can tell you it's a lot easier if you catch them earlier. So we have a preschool, a kindergarten through fifth grade elementary school, and a middle school, a learning continuum, pre-K through 12 in one geographic area. Let me give you the elementary data point because it, it, it capsulizes all that we're talking about here. In our elementary school, it's 93% of African-American kids in a poor neighborhood. Remember the gap, very big. 90, 90 some odd percent African-Americans in this one school. When we started that school, the gap was here as we talked about. At the end of four years, the gap was even. Like how cool is that in four years that the environment at this school created the success indicators and the yard marks that we all want to aspire to, that kids in this neighborhood, regardless of the color of their skin, did equally as well as white kids across the city or anywhere in the country, even. Now we're three years later, it's a reverse gap. 
You guys get that? <laughs> the kids at this school are outperforming their counterparts who are white in other neighborhoods throughout. It's the top five, it's one of the top five elementary schools in the city of Sacramento, regardless. So here's my point to the group here. If you create an environment of high expectations, which, let me, the elementary school, if you go to our elementary school today, outside the kindergarten's classroom, it'll say 2027, the year they're graduating from college. You cannot tell them they're not graduating college. You can ask them, did your mom go? They're going to say, no. Nope. Did your dad go? They're going to say, no. Nope. Did anybody in your family go? They're going to say, I don't know. But they're going to say, I'm going. And I'm going to graduate in 2027. They have visited, I believe, every year, Cal Berkeley and Stanford. They've been there more times in their little lifetime than I've been my whole, anyway. So <laughs> high expectations. High expectations. Number two, if kids are starting behind, you've got to put more time in. You have longer school days, longer school, all these things. It's, it's not rockets. I'm sorry, it's not a big idea. It's, it's, it's another not a big idea. But you put a longer school day together, the parents play a critical role, which you know. So we have a contract between parents, teacher, and student, a three-way contract that they all sign, a commitment to ex excellence contract. Our teachers, they're not afraid of data. They look at data to determine whether or not kids are learning or not. They look at data to determine where kids aren't learning and say, we need to focus more time and energy there. The principal looks at data over the course of a year because if a teacher is not moving their children along, then they've got to do some, some massive intervention. And if it still doesn't happen for a year or two, that teacher is not going to be able to work there because the stakes are too high because these are children. And then you take another teacher who's moving a kid up. The goal is one grade level, maybe two, who's moving kids up two, two and a half, grade levels, you want to learn from that, what that teacher's doing. Then you get other teachers and you kind of share best practices, all those sorts of things. Those are happening in this elementary school, top elementary school in the country, and it's very, very exciting in terms of what can happen. And my point on this to the group here is you have to believe that children, no matter what neighborhood, no matter what color their skin is, that they can perform at high levels if they have access to a high, high quality education. I understand poverty plays a role. I understand the family nucleus plays a role. All those things are true, but they cannot be an excuse. I'm one of the kids. Don't let that be an excuse. Don't tell me, yeah, their home life is screwed up. It, all that's true. We need to work on that in parallel track. But nonetheless, the world and society is not going to make adjustments and allowances because something is not where it should be at home. You guys have to find a way to create those realities where these kids can do extremely well. And that, to me, is part of a very important message. I'm going to kind of close out with this. I talked about Arnie Duncan, the race to the top. Unprecedented opportunity here. $4.3 billion that are going to go to different states around the country if they're doing a couple things. Using data, teacher evaluation, student performance, connecting the two. Remove the firewall, all those things you've heard of. Like, how in the world can you not look at data to determine. And it shouldn't be the only measurement, let me just be clear. There should be multiple measurements, but data has to be one. If you don't do that, we'll never know what's happening or not happening. In, in California, for instance, there are 300,000 teachers. If you take the top 10% of teachers, 30,000, we should all be learning from them. The bottom 30%, the bottom 30,000, we should be doing, again, intensive intervention, and if they're not improving, you got to get them out and get somebody else in. You guys get on that? In California, we don't know the difference. We can't tell you who's who. Like, it makes no sense. Like, literally, we have no idea. So the, the, the president and, and the secretary of education is saying to us in California, you got to get with it. You got to get with it on student data. You got to have common standards so we can kind of compare apples to apples and not apples to oranges. You've got to make sure you remove the, the charter school cap. Charter schools are not the panacea to solve education. They are just one key component that creates a competitive environment that will improve education. So you've got to let charter schools play. You've got to have open enrollment. You've got to let parents say, if my neighborhood school is not doing well, then I've got to be able to send my son or daughter to another school. Like, how in the world can you deprive somebody? That it makes no sense in my head. And then lastly, I talked about the lowest performing schools. You have to either close them down 
reconstitute them or doing something radical. That is happening at the top. That's happening from the president all the way down. We in California are this close, there's a vote today, on whether or not we as a state are going to be eligible for those dollars. And it's probably not going to happen. Politics, adult issues, status quo, is going to do everything they can, just like they did to the little high school in Sacramento, to make sure things stay the way they are. So I would beg you, do not let adult issues trump what's in the best interest of children. Everything we do should be what is in the best interest of that young person and their lives and how can we impact them in a significant way. And adult issues have to be secondary. We are not quite there um, as a country. Uh, Detroit, I don't know if anybody saw this, but Detroit has the very worst school system in the country. Came out yesterday, NAEP scores, the worst. Auto industry hit, hosting one challenges, the worst in the country. That impacts all of us. We can't just say that's just Detroit over there. Let them work it out. It's going to impact all of us. And that's why I think together we have to have this commitment that we're going to fight like crazy, do everything we can to create an environment where every kid, again, no matter the color of their skin, the zip code they live in, we know they can do equally as well or better than their counterparts if they have access to that. And that's what I am I'm here today to share with you it is when you leave here today, just remember, the status quo will do everything it can to protect itself. Don't make decisions in terms of what's best for adults. Do it for what's best for children. Don't be afraid to innovate. Don't try to tweak around the edges. You gotta innovate and be bold. Take chances. There's a new industry out there in this education reform movement, which I don't like the word reform, but the education reform movement, where people are willing to do bold things. There's social entrepreneurs out there, Teach for America, the New Teacher Project, New Leaders for New Schools. Many of them have presented here before you over the last three days. We all have a chance to work together. And again, education is our civil rights issue of the 21st century. So thank you very much for your time. And Thank you. Thank you. All right, a couple questions, then you guys can eat lunch. All right. Got the mic there. Hi, partner. Now, you're in Sacramento, and I'm in Sacramento often. Yes. You elected official using bully pulpit. I managed to earn a seat on the California State Board, so I do have jurisdiction of 1,100 districts yep. and six, seven million kids. I do have the marching order from this group. So what's your marching order for me in the policy level as from this point out? So, I mean, th I mean, think about that. What she's saying right here is what can they do at the state level? She's on the California Department of Education Board. I mean, that, it doesn't get any better than that. I mean, it really doesn't. That This is a, a policy maker in the state saying, I'm not afraid of the status quo. I'm not afraid of what's politically convenient or attractive. I want to do what's right. So what I would say, I'm going to give you a short-term focus. So is, is Ted still the chair? So the assembly today, they're going to vote and they're going to probably get a bill out of the House. It's not going to be the one that was the Romero bill out of the Senate or what the governor wanted. So it's politics here. But my, my, what I would beg you to do is between now and the time that we turn our application in in California, that we try to get the most competitive application forward. If California is highly competitive, then we'll get raced to the top dollars. If we're not highly competitive, they're going to choose other states, and we're going to be left behind. So that, that is January 19th. So what I would love, if you can talk to your colleagues, I can have somebody in my office talk to you. We're going to have about a month fight to try to make California highly competitive. That's where I think it starts. We meet in December. Great. Perfect. I will have somebody. You guys have public meetings, too? Yes. It's part of it public, right? So I'll have somebody from my office there as well. Thank you for that. 
I just wanted to build on that. What do you define as highly competitive? Is it a not watered down plan, really initiative, um, not reform? Yeah, it's, it's basically <clears throat> what the assembly is, bless their hearts, but what they're, what they're putting out is a very watered down bill, very watered down. <clears throat> There's five areas. And let me, I'll just give you one since I want you all to eat, catch your flights. But if, 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 the, if the, uh, <clears throat> the president and the secretary of education are saying, we need states to be highly competitive, not just trying to get some money. You've got to say you have a real agenda for innovation and reform in your state. And you're not willing to let up until you get there. California is not talking that talk right now. So that's just general. The spirit of it is the first part. The second part is, you take one example, what the governor, whether you support the governor or not, and what the Senate did is they came out, a bill, came out with a bill that had five key areas, and those five key areas lined up with the president's five key areas, and within there are bold things to do. The assembly bill had the five key areas, and in there it's murky, it's cloudy, it's watered down, it's not bold, the spirit of it's not there. So the parent piece would be the example. <laughs> The, the president and everyone else wants parents to be able to choose if their school is failing, can they send their kid to another school? And can they petition as 50% 50 parent, 50 of parents to say, that school has not been serving us well. Can you close it down, reopen it, and give us a chance to have a neighborhood school? The assembly bill's watered down that doesn't let that happen. So that's just one example. And it's happening in data, in the charter piece, all the way down the line. Uh, just two things. One, I want to thank you for uh, revamping Sac High. My granddaughter, the oldest grandchild, it profited from that. Awesome. Uh, dispirited, angry, giving her parents problems. Got to Sac High, finished, got accepted to four, uh, four year institutions. Awesome. awesome thing. Cool. Um, So a request, I know the power of Kevin. I also know the power of Yvonne. My request is that you include the lobbyists of AXA and CSBA, which cover all of the K-12 for us. To, uh, the invitation is to join you in the effort to get that done over the next month. I, I appreciate that. So let, let me just say that, I mean, again, remember, I have no jurisdiction on schools in the city of Sacramento. Look at me. I'm up in the state of California's business which makes no sense, but too much is at stake. So I'm in, I'm in Washington, D.C. I flew in from Washington, D.C. Was it yes, last night? I can't remember. But <laughs> when I got here, I was in D.C. before I got here, whatever day it was. And I'm meeting with the Secretary of Education's people. And they're like, California, you're not, you're just, you're not, you're not gonna, it doesn't look promising. That drives me crazy that the state that I live in and local school districts and children are going to be impacted. California used to be the state that would, that would lead the race to the top, you know, that would be the leader of what should be done. As goes California, the rest of the country goes. Now we're leading the race to retreat because politics. So, you know, Yvonne, I mean, my point is, and to your point, I mean, we got, we're going to have two to four weeks to really fight like crazy to make ourselves eligible. And it's a fight worth fighting, even if we have to work twice as long. All right, last question or two, and then I'll please feed these folks. Um. You partially answered one question I was going to ask about how this isn't really so much about getting that money from the race to the top. It's about, Absolutely not. You know, like, we're going to do this anyway, and let's just convince everyone. But I actually am going to ask a question more as a parent, and this is something I'm struggling with a lot, which is there's some realities on the ground. I've got to go to work. So does my wife. So does almost everybody else I know. And we have a certain amount of time. And, of course, we want to devote whatever we can to improving our local public school. My kids go. And it's just like, damn. You know, there's just certain constraints on what we can do. We can't just opt out and homeschool, right? We can't just start creating a totally alternative pathway that doesn't have some place for them to physically be during the day. And, and how much time, like, how do we know? Where's the encouragement at the parental level, at the community level? How, what are the ways we can engage so we're telling everybody, you know, this needs to be solved, right? We're trying to live and eat and we want the best for our kids, but anyway. Any guidance or inspiration on that would be great. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, I think what you're articulating, a lot of people feel, right? I mean, but let me, let me just say first and foremost, make sure your son or daughter 
gets a good education. You know, like helping the rest of the world is, is all fine. Take care of your kids first, and then whatever time you have left, then be a part of the movement. So, I mean, I'm just unapologetic, you know, toward that. If you got a great public school, great. And if you got an almost good public school and you have to put a little more time in to get it there, so be it. If you don't have a good public school and you can afford to send your kids to private school, you know, you got to protect your kids first. I mean, I just I don't want anybody to ever lose sight of that. Now, with that said, there's a much bigger fight here. And what I would encourage you to do is, as you're talking to parents, you know, there, there, there's three simple questions that every parent could ask of their school to hold them accountable. Is my son or daughter at grade level? So not just you. So you, you're asking about your son or daughter, but it really goes across all the, the kids in schools, like what percentage of kids are at grade level? That's the first question. The second question, is my son or daughter on track to go to a four-year college? I mean, are they taking the classes, AP or whatever the classes are, to go to four-year college? And if those two answers are, are yes, so be it. And the third question is, if it's no to either of those, then what is the school doing to make sure that those two things happen? That's a simple way for parents to hold their classroom teacher, their principal, their schools, and their school districts accountable. Just those three questions. And you know what's going to happen? People are going to be amazed when they find out that their son or daughter is not on grade level or that their school is not performing at the level it should be, or one neighborhood school has 15 API, API, AP classes for college, another school has two, like it starts, in, and then you create an outrage, then people get frustrated. That's what we need from the grassroots that's missing to me. So look for a parent organization. I'm in Sacramento. We're gonna do something very radical when it comes to parents. We wanna create a school report card for schools. So in California, you have an API, some school gets a 600, a 620, a set, like no one knows what that means. I want to look, I want, I want a citizen of Sacramento to punch up Sacramento City Schools and see an A grade, a B grade, a C grade, a D or F. You know, just simple that you can explain it. So my daughter's going to a, a B grade school. I'm going to ask the teacher, what do we need to do to get to an A? And you've got a whole bunch of families who send their children to schools that are F. And they'll be like, wait, I didn't know that. What do you mean it's F? How come I didn't know? Like, literally, that's what you, like, most people don't know that their schools are bad. This whole notion of mediocrity and no accountability, it rules the day. And that, to me, is where the opportunity is, understanding what, where a school is performing and you as parents asking questions to whatever you're comfortable doing. All right, last question. The student in the room. I love it. Obviously, you're here, you're, you're here to encourage education, but what are you going to personally do to make it better? Um, when I was in high school, I remember one you're of my biggest high school problems. Now. You're not in high school now? Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> See who runs the world right there, students. One of my biggest problems when I was in high school was that my teachers, I had a lot of bad teachers. What are you going to do, do to make teachers better? Yeah, I mean, are you I a know that you're not, like you said, you... Are you a college student? No. You're older than college? No. Okay, how, if you don't mind, roughly how old are you? How old are you? I'm 30. Does that make a difference? <laughs> Holy Toledo. It's funny, I, I sit down next to her and she goes, what are you talking about today? And I said, I haven't made my mind up. She goes, oh my goodness. <laughs> so here, here's her point. She wants to know, we're talking about this broadly, but what, what can I do? So a couple things. One, I started an organization that runs charter schools. So that has continued to go on where we have good quality teachers in the classroom. Um, we also run a charter school in New York City, which is kind of cool. So those kids can now do exchanges from California to New York, which that's what all middle class rich people do. And I was like, why couldn't our, anyway. So that's one. Um, secondly, I am fighting right now to make sure our state creates an environment where every school has great teachers in the classroom. That's what this whole kind of race to the top thing is about. And then lastly, as a mayor of Sacramento, which to your point, I have no jurisdiction, I'm starting an organization that wants to do three, three critical things. Number one, remember I just said a school report card? That we want to create a school report card so we know what every school is doing. 
Uh, number two, we want school options, meaning we want a portfolio of good schools for our kids to choose from in Sacramento. So charter schools and thematic schools and talented and gifted schools and all that. Every neighborhood needs those, not just one school in one city. You need them in every neighborhood. And then lastly, to your point, human capital. I believe our city needs more great principals and great teachers in it. And there's organizations around the country that do a great job of attracting young teachers or mid-year professionals who transfer careers. They may be a, a nurse or a doctor and they want to get into education. There's organizations like that in the country. I'm trying to get them to come to Sacramento so that all of our classrooms and all of our kids have really energetic, energetic teachers who believe that every kid can learn. Um, my goal in education and my goal as a mayor is this. If I, I this, I'm at the end of year one in my term this month. So a term is four years. If I run for your reelection, it's eight years. I would love to eight years look back and that Sacramento as a city is known for great public schools. That would, and I don't have anything to do with it. That's the odd thing about it. But to me, it's the most important, it's the most important thing that I could possibly do. So I appreciate that. All right, everybody, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>